Beloved, let's start this talk with a prayer that many of us remember from childhood. And let us pray, Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light, guard, to rule and guide, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. All right, so tonight's talk is called Angels, Spiritual Beings Among Us. And you know, we all had that elementary understanding of angels when we were younger with perhaps that was the first or second or third prayer you ever learned. I know it was one of the first, along with the Our Father and the Hail Mary that I learned growing up. And there's, there's much that the church says about angels, but I think in many ways they seem to be the forgotten beings among us. So uh, tonight's talk, we're going to, talk about the Catholic view on angels. And I just want to say a, a couple of, of things before I begin. Uh, firstly, much of the information tonight on angels comes from the consensus of theologians, okay, versus church dogma. All right, now, now certainly the reality of angels is affirmed in both sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which are the two wellsprings of our Catholic faith. But nevertheless, um, much of what I'm talking about tonight comes from sources including commentaries by great saints like St. Thomas Aquinas, then St. Bonaventure also, St. Pope Gregory the Great, and others. Okay, but what is affirmed in both scripture and tradition is that angels were created at the beginning of time. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says the existence of the spiritual, non-corporal, meaning they don't have a body, beings known as angels is a truth of the faith. St. Augustine states that angel is their office, but spirit is their nature. Okay, so uh, in, in certain ways angels are like us, but they do not have a body. They are pure spirit. Each angel is individually created by God in the same way he creates each of us. St. John Damascene said, angels are secondary spiritual lights who receive their brightness from the first light, meaning God. So just as natural light reveals the world to our eyes, angels can help make the supernatural light of God's glory more visible to us. So angels, they don't solve the mysteries of God for us, but they lead us further into the sacred mysteries. So what do angels do? And there's two main things that we can say angels do. And, and this is disputed by no one within the church. One, they glorify God. Okay, that, that is their primary task. But they are also, they are angelus, means messenger. They are the messengers of God throughout sacred scripture. But what angels are not? Scripture. But what angels are not? They're not mythical creatures that modern science has debunked. Okay? Creatures that come out once a year for Christmas cards and decorations. I guess, I guess that's part of it. I'm sure the angels don't mind being depicted in that way, but they're not exclusively that. They are not mere expressions of our psyche. You know, we've all heard the terms like his better angel or her inner demons. And they are also not an extension of God. They are, they are created creatures just the same as we are. Once again, St. Thomas Aquinas, he was known as the angelic doctor. He tells us angels move by exercising their will or power in one place like daylight in a room. They occupy the room, but if we were to close the shades, we can't contain that daylight in the room. 
So they are not contained to that space even though they occupy it. And then the question is, how do angels know what they know? The, the theological term for that is angelic epistemology. St. Thomas tells us that they are infused with all the natural knowledge that they need to perform their mission. And again, what is their mission? Twofold, glorify God, and they serve as God's messengers to us. However, just because of their superior knowledge and powers compared to us human beings, I think we sometimes demand of angels what we should not. All right, so they're not going to swoop in right now to somebody's ear and whisper the winning Powerball numbers to you. That would be amazing, but... <laughs> and they're not necessarily going to help us cure a loved one's disease either, in a more serious note. So some theologians believe, however, that the false expectations that we put on angels leads the faithful to question their very existence or lead us to feel rejected by them. Now I want to get to an important question is, what can angels do for us? Angels can help, number one, realign our expectations and point us towards God. Okay, the, the secondary lights always point us towards he who is light, God, God himself. You know, just, just the same as without the sun, the moon would have no natural light. They help dispose us towards God's providence. And three, they protect us from evil. Now, there's plenty of examples from sacred scripture, I just want to name a few, of angelic influence. So, they're the messengers, and sometimes the messengers perform rescue missions. Okay, so, for example, in the first book of Kings, chapter 19, angels minister to and strengthen the prophet Elijah by providing him with cakes and water. I think that was a reading very recently in, in recent Sunday reading. In Genesis chapter 19, Lot is rescued from the destruction of Sodom by angels. Daniel in the lion's den testifies how, quote, my God sent his angel and closed the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me. And my favorite, because I remember when I was in college, I, um, a priest asked me to do the daily reading Old as I was, I didn't read it beforehand. And it was the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> and as you all know, those three names are repeated over and over and over in that reading. So I, I, there's a close place in my heart for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So anyway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they defy King Nebuchadnezzar's demand to worship the golden statue. So the king cast them into the fire. Not only do these three survive, but the king sees a fourth man in the fire who is described appearing like a, quote, son of God. Later on, that is affirmed to be an angel. In fact, in the Old Testament, the term son of God frequently means angel. It's a synonym. So as I mentioned, angels are the messengers of the Bible par excellence. And to be a messenger, you are vested with the sender's authority. If the Pope sends a, a cardinal out somewhere on mission, he has the authority of the Pope to do whatever the Pope needs to do. If Father Pat sends me somewhere. I have the authority to do whatever Father Pat needs. So as you know, carrying messages can be dangerous work. So just the same as a messenger in wartime going from you know, across the, the Western Front, for example, in World War I, it was very dangerous. Humility is needed and the need to blend in if necessary. You don't want to stand out if you're a messenger. So humility and invisibility are tied together. I want to bring up something that we pray at every Sunday Mass, and that is the Nicene Creed. Okay, now, sometimes in Easter, you pray the Apostles' Creed, but 
most of the year we pray the Nicene Creed. And you guys all know it. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Have you ever given thought to that line of things visible? Or do we just say it? I just say it. I mean, I'll be honest. Most of the time, 99 out of 100 times, I just say it. You know, sometimes I'll think of one line. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. But how often do we think of things visible and invisible? You know, um, we detect, we interpret the world through the mediation of our five senses. I mentioned that in a homily recently. Um, but we, we don't detect what is invisible, right? Angels can generally not be detected using our five human senses. They are pure spirits, but they are real and are very much present. So angels are personal beings. No two angels are the same. And each one has its own name, as personal beings do. Each of you has a name. And no, you cannot name your angel. Now, now sometimes, and, and I don't doubt this, this is not, again, um, dogma of the church, but I think sometimes guardian angels can reveal their names to people. My father claims when he was a little boy, at the edge of his bed, he saw his guardian angel, and that, that angel said his name was Horace. I, I, I truly, I, that's my personal belief, I believe that angels can reveal their names, but you can't name your, your angel. They have intellect and will, okay? They, they, like us, have intellect and will, but they, are, unlike us, are not subject to time and space. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 330, if you're looking this up, um, says that angels surpass visible creatures, meaning us, meaning the animals, in perfection and are personal and immortal. They do not die. In their humility, they always point the way to Jesus Christ. Again, messengers have to be humble. So there are also, as I mentioned, some examples of angels performing rescue missions, like covert winged Navy SEALs. Angels also are, are the messengers of sacred scripture. So. Some examples of this, again, and, and throughout not only the, the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. Um, in the Old Testament, Daniel saw the angel Gabriel when he was praying, and he said that Gabriel, quote, came to me in flight. So Gabriel bore Daniel a message from God. Uh, Gabriel, one of three named angels in the Bible, along with Michael and Raphael, Gabriel appeared to the priest Zechariah to announce Elizabeth's pregnancy. He st the angel stood at the right of the altar of incense. And uh, Luke in his gospel notes that there was a multitude of people praying, but only one saw the angel, Zechariah. And then, of course, the most famous of, of all um, is when Gabriel bears the message of the Annunciation to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So when angels assume bodily form, it is for a mission. It is not part of their nature. Okay? Um, you know, Archbishop Fulton Sheen famously used the example. He said, it's like those dickies that the waiters wear in the fancy restaurants. There's a zipper in the back and they toss it away. All right? So, uh, but in our limited capacity, we might not know right away that the seeming person that we're seeing is actually an angel. Uh, for example, Joshua saw an angel with a sword and asked, are you one of us, Me meaning an Israelite, or one of our enemies? So the angel proclaimed that he was actually, quote, the commander of the army of the Lord. So Joshua fell down in homage uh, to the Lord's angel, and then the angel delivered Joshua a message. And notably, in the New Testament, the angels are present throughout Jesus' life and ministry here on earth. So from incarnation to ascension, the very beginning to, to the very end, um, they make their presence felt. Uh, in Luke chapter 22, in the agony in the garden, Scripture tells us that 
there appeared to Jesus an angel from heaven, quote, strengthening him. I want to read a couple sections, actually, from sacred scripture. Uh, chapter 16 of Mark's gospel. We can see that the resurrection of Jesus is the chapter heading. I want to read here. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him, meaning the body of Jesus. Very early, when the sun had risen on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, Who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe. And they were utterly amazed. He said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And then they, they fled from, from that scene. And it says that they were struck with fear and amazement. So we see here, an angel proclaims and announces the resurrection. Another passage that is key in, in sacred scripture to our understanding of angels is the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is perhaps the most comprehensive of all the books of the New Testament on dealing with this subject. I, I do want to read from the book of Hebrews as well. Um, it's chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews. So chapter 1, letter to the Hebrews says as follows. When Jesus had accomplished purification from sins, he took his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high, as far superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, this day I have begotten you, or again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And again, when he leads the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, and his ministers a fiery flame. And so we can see here that, number one, it shows that angels, again, are not a part of God but that Jesus Christ is superior to the angels. We can even call Jesus king of the angels. Now, I do have a few words on fallen angels. No, don't, don't, don't. I heard the, somebody over there. <laughs> so in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light. We all know that. But just one verse later we read, God saw that the light was good. God then separated the light from the darkness. Many theologians believe that it was at this point in creation that the once and for all choice was made that some angels said they would not serve God. They became part of that darkness. So God has revealed to the angels natural knowledge and supernatural revelation. They had to, like, like we do, we choose to do good. That's an act of the will. But some angels, through the sin of pride, chose not to serve God. And so again, the general consensus of theologians, some that I've mentioned, including Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, was that each angel was tested after the creation, but before seeing God face to face in the beatific vision. Lucifer, as St. Gregory the Great notes, was the bearer of light who surpassed all angels in their luminosity. Pages are sticking together. There we go. 
the Father revealed to all the angels that the second person of the Trinity would take on a human nature. Lucifer could not accept that man would be divinized in the person of Christ and elevated in the supernatural order. So man, human beings, are created in God's image and likeness. And that's why, you know, as Catholic Christians, we have a consistent ethic of life from conception until natural death, that each and every human being is created in God's image and likeness. That's not true of the angels. So what does Lucifer say? Famously, non servium, I will not serve. At once, Lucifer hates all that is good and uses his angelic nature against God. So angels, like, like us, have intellect and will. But with our limited intellect and imperfect use of will, we, we do not always know the full consequences of our actions, good or bad. Okay, now we know immediate actions. You know, you can't just go up to somebody and, and push them down or, or steal their money. Those are sins. Those are bad. Um, but we don't know some of the long-term consequences for our actions. And that th thus, um, God offers to forgive us 70 times 7. The angels have greater natural knowledge than us, and they can see, they're, they're, they're not limited to space and time, so they know the full measure of every action they take. So when Lucifer says, I will not serve, he knows that he's making a once and for all decision to reject God. When, when we reject God, we always, as long as we're drawing breath, I'm going off script here, <laughs> we, we have an opportunity to reconcile with, with, with our Lord. You know, even that, that, you know, you think about Saint Dismas hanging on the cross next to Jesus. At first, he was cursing him like the other, the other thief, but then we know today he's called the good thief because today he will be with Jesus in paradise, as he said. Uh, saint Maximilian Kolbe, um, we know him as the great saint who gave up his life to save a, a, a stranger during the Holocaust. Um, he believed in the pious tradition that Lucifer also rebelled at the notion that Mary would be queen of the angels. And one of Mary's husband, Jesus' foster father, Joseph's titles, is terror of demons. Um, so Satan, you know, Satan doesn't just resist and refute God. He seeks to attack all that is good. So praying to the Holy Family uh, it is believed by many, is a good way to ward off any attacks on the family. I want to turn to a reading, I think that it confuses a lot of people. Uh, it was read for the recent feast, the great solemnity of, of the Assumption of Mary. It's from the book of Revelation. So Revelation uh, chapter 12, it's the woman and the dragon. A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of 12 stars. She was with child and wailed aloud in pain as she labored to give birth. Then another sign appeared in the sky. It was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven diadems. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in the sky and hurled them down to the earth. I want to focus on that last line there. So St. Thomas Aquinas believed that, well, first of all, Universally, the dragon is identified as the ancient serpent, Satan. But Aquinas believed that the sweeping of the stars in the sky were not literal stars like, like the ones we see in the night sky today, but those were rebellious angels falling, the demons. It's believed that one-third rebelled against God. So there, there's an interesting interpretation from one of our great saints on that uh, enigmatic passage. Now again, 
Do you have to believe that to be the case? No. Um, but it is, it is something that um, you know, one of our, our great saints and, and theologians in church history put forth. Other examples of you know, um, the bad angels in sacred scripture, in, in the book of Job in chapter 1, there's a meeting between God and men who are called the sons of God. Again, sons of God in the Old Testament generally means angels. And then Satan intervenes. God asks Satan, Whence have you come? Satan replies, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. Uh, the New Testament verse that goes along with that is 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 8. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan prefers temptation to possession as the latter can frighten people and frighten them into God. So Lucifer and the fallen angels were the beginning of hell. The fallen angels wished to separate as many human beings from God as they could. The Catechism actually teaches us that evil, quote, evil is not an abstraction but refers to a person, Satan, the evil one, the angel who opposes God. But now for some good news. The majority of the angels accepted the incarnation and submitted to God. So the final victory is assured despite any evil we might experience in this world or see in this world. In fact, tradition with a capital T teaches us that a voice from the eighth choir of angels, more on the choirs in a minute, came from the archangel Michael, whose name means who is like unto God. This lower angel was given the special task of becoming the commander of the army of angels in heaven. So choirs, the choirs of angels are established in scripture by name but the details come from theologians, from saints of the church, and from church doctors. Again, you can choose not to believe this, and you can be perfectly aligned with, you have to believe in angels, but the details I'm about to read about the, the choirs and the hierarchies, um, this is up for your prayerful discernment. Each hierarchy contains three choirs. So there's three hierarchies of angels with nine choirs total. The first is to contemplate God in his infinite goodness, to adore the divine presence. And again, each of these by name is mentioned in sacred scripture in some way. Again, the details uh, come from sources outside scripture, but solid Catholic sources. We have the seraphim. The seraph in Hebrew means burning or to burn, they're mentioned twice in Isaiah chapter 6. They are described as having six wings. You want to know where wings from angels comes from? With three pairs. They repeat the words, holy, holy, holy. We, we, we say that or sing that at every Mass. Holy, holy, holy. We're, we're speaking in the terms of angels. In the old school, you guys knew, right? Sanctos, sanctos, right? in front of God's throne. Can, they can also purify men. The lips of the prophet Isaiah are purified by a seraph. The cherubim. The cherubim excel in truth and knowledge about God. They are mentioned in Genesis chapter 3, protecting the tree of life with a flaming sword. And they are also the angels found next to the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25. The thrones are mentioned in Colossians chapter 1 when uh, St. Paul says, whether thrones or dominions or powers or principalities, they represent firmness in the presence of God and steadfastness to God, according to St. Bonaventure. The second hierarchy receives illumination from the first and they govern the cosmos. So the, the first hierarchy, though the highest, they are totally dedicated to glorify God. The second have more involvement in the material world. 
The dominions are the first choir of the second hierarchy. They indicate lordship. They have dominion over created things. And they have a role in the heavenly government. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us they appoint those things that are to be done to lower choirs. The virtues, they denote the potency of God. Uh, St. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 refers to these as, quote, good angels. He said that they are in charge of miracles and miraculous signs. The powers refer to power and strength of God. Um, St. Thomas says, irresistible but not tyrannical power that leads to God. In fact, Ephesians uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 10 and verse 12 tell us that there are good and bad powers, but the good ones are specified as the ones who battle against evil spirits. Finally, we have the third hierarchy. Uh, they receive illumination from the second hierarchy and carry out what needs to be done specifically as it pertains to humans. So the third um, hierarchy has much to do with our human affairs. The principalities denote princely dignity. They are the leaders of the lower hierarchy. St. Jude, in his letter, says this was the choir that had the most defections to Satan. They intercede for the virtue of obedience to proper authority. Archangels, they're the officers of the lower hierarchy. Uh, they appear in 1 Thessalonians and Jude. They deliver the most important messages to humanity. So the term refers both to the choir and to the angel leaders in general. And finally, uh, last but not least, are the angels. They are charged with guarding and supporting man. The vast majority of guardian angels come from this choir. Uh, St. Thomas tells us to make sure we love and have a friendship with our guardian angel. And again, guardian angels generally are believed to come from the last of the nine choirs of angels who are called angels. I want to speak about, got started with guardian angels. I want to just speak about them briefly. They are the group of angels most concerned with our eternal fate. Their task is to guide human beings to salvation. And where do we get our theology on guardian angels from? In one place, sacred scripture. In uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 10, Jesus says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, meaning children, for I tell you that in heaven their angels, their angels, possessive, always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So Christian mystics, in the course of 2,000 years of our church, have had visions of guardian angels kneeling around the altar during each and every Mass. Another saint in our church, if you've ever been to Stockbridge, Massachusetts, the National Shrine for Divine Mercy, um, St. Faustina Kowalska, in her diary, says, quote, Oh, how little people reflect that they have always have an angel beside them, a witness to everything. Remember, sinners, that you likewise have a witness to all your deeds. Pope Francis says, guardian angels, this is a quote, guardian angels exist. They are not imaginative doctrine, but companions that God has placed beside us on our life's journey and should be listened to because it's dangerous to reject your travel companion. He went on and said, listen to your angel's voice. Do not rebel against it. In fact, we have a feast day on the church calendar dedicated to the guardian angels, October 2nd. And there's another feast day dedicated to Saints Raphael, Michael, and Gabriel, and that's September 29th. So there are angels are, are felt in the church as well, including our liturgy. Catechism teaches us, uh, paragraph 334, quote, the whole life of the church benefits from the mysterious 
and powerful help of angels. They are invoked in the funeral liturgy, in the hymn, May the Angels Lead You to Paradise. We all know that hymn, right? Do, 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 do. It's got a very nice, makes you think of the angels. Prayers in the Mass, including the Eucharistic prayers and prefaces. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven. You ever given thought to that? We've heard those lines, right? Now, when we give thought to it, we can think of the choirs of angels. It's naming the choirs of angels in the Mass. We sing the hymn of your glory as without end we proclaim. And then we go, holy, 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 the words of the angels. In Eucharistic Prayer 1, also known as the Roman Canon, we have the line, in humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty. So we see even within each and every Mass, we give thanks and praise to God and his angels. I want to end with a quote from the Catechism. And it says, um, paragraph 336, from its beginning until end, human life is surrounded by the watchful care and intercession of angels. Friends, we, we, we always take in the visible world, right? How often do we give thought to the invisible world? There is much that in our picayune human wisdom and knowledge, um, we, we just don't understand on this side of the veil. And I think the, the angels are certainly part of that. They, they are in many ways shrouded in mystery, but our church has definitive teachings on them. They are indeed real. They are indeed present with us. Thank you. John, how do we want to do questions? Well, um, I, we do have time for questions. And if anyone would like to uh, start us off, we have them come up here, or how do we? No, I think we'll, we'll try to find them where they are. Can I have a messenger? <laughs> bring the mic. Bring, we'll bring them. Who wants to be the messenger and bring the mic over? OK, you want to run the mic for me? Thank you so much. Oh, we got somebody right behind me. All right, yeah, there we go. Okay, so uh, just raise your hand. I'll answer like this. I can speak up right there. We, we need this mic right We need here. that one too? Okay. We need to use Do I need on this one. mic? I, I'm on this mic. Okay. We need to use this one to record what they're saying. I understand. Okay. Okay, so we got to give them two mics at once. Oh, boy. Well, he's going to need two. Okay. Put I know Tom. Back to back. Well, I know Tom too, so. Oh, boy. So or so. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Both, both, both mics up to his mouth. One is for us, one's for the live stream. Yes, double oh, okay. fist. Yes. So our soul, yes. when we die, how does that fit into this spiritual angel thingy? <laughs> Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. When Christ comes again, our bodies, humans, our bodies and souls will be reunited. How exactly that works, we don't know, but that's the teaching. Angels never had a body to begin with. So they, they are existent in their, their pure spirit. Yep. So the way angels were from the beginning of time to the end, they will always be pure spirit. So yeah, um, when, when we die, our soul goes to its destiny. Our body will be reunited on the last day. I hope that, yeah, that's the best. No, I'm, just, I'm just wondering where they're going to put all those I, I don't know the answer to that. We, we, we conceive things in space and time. I, I think, um, I always just say I trust in God. All right. Oh. This lady over here? Okay, yeah, and then, and then the gentleman. Okay, yep. sure. Oh, good, thank Don't you. Worry. When you die, what happens to your guardian angel? Yep. Um, you can... So theologians have talked about this, and the belief is that you will be able to talk to your angel in heaven. It's not like they won't have anything to do with you someday. Your guardian angel, yes. Uh, but, but they were created specifically from the beginning of time to serve as your guardian angel. Each, each person, it's believed, um, has their own guardian angel from the beginning of time. 
created for that purpose, to get you to heaven. Yep. This gentleman right here. Oh, okay. Two-fisted. Tennis like food on an airplane. There you go. All right. <laughs> okay, tell us about cherubs. Artists like to show in their paintings chubby little angels floating around. And um, the artist uh, take artist uh, liberties. And uh, the angels, these little cherubs, are, um, they have a gender. They're male and female. Um, what are your thoughts about gender in angels? Yep. I would think being a spiritual being without a body, the gender thing doesn't fit. So these artists are doing, shall we say, artist type things, not spiritual, scriptural things. Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak on that. Um, theologians have said that angels do not have a sex. They're neither male nor female. Right. Um, the, the, the cherub, the cherub-like angels in particular, the ones from Raphael, the great Renaissance painter, we've all seen that little, they're like, the one is kind of like this, and I, I think that image of angels has become like the model for the popular version of, of angels. Um, I think it's okay to, to continue to love that style of angel and know that the reality of the spiritual beings that are angels is much broader and bigger and more important than than Renaissance art or subsequent art. If that makes sense. Okay. Up oh, all the way in the back there. Uh, you're you're getting a workout. That, yeah, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. John, one more after this. Okay. What can you tell us about, there was an archangel, Uriel, in old scripture. And, you know, what can you say about him? Uh, it was a question on, on Catholic answers. Um, and theologians are divided on what he means for our faith. That's all, that's all I can really answer you on that particular angel right now. I can tell you that the three that are recognized... Um, by the church, and we have their own day, are Raphael or Raphael, um, depending on how you pronounce it, Michael and Gabriel. We, one last question right here, in, in the front here. Oh, wait, wait, you got to wait for the mic. Yep. been very powerful, but Thank I you. just wondered what caused it. Yep. Um, one, the, the, I knew the Knights wanted to do a talk, and I had a talk prepared because I was curious in the subject myself. So um, Father Stephen Yesko and I do a series called Furthering Your Faith, which we've done talks here. I don't remember what, uh, Deacon Eddie, do you remember what talks were done here? Father, oh, I, did, I did one on confirmation here, on, on the sacrament. Anybody remember that, that talk? Um, so um, just subjects that are, are germane to our, our Catholic faith that I think people would be interested in. And, and I think people are interested in angels. You know, um, you know if, if I did a talk on the theology of transubstantiation, I'd probably have, like, Deacon Eddie. <laughs> Tom. Maybe, maybe Tom, yeah, maybe Tom, you know, and, that, and that's probably it. So um, uh, anyway, uh, angels is a great subject, you know, um, and, and I think it's one that we all want to know more about because they are ubiquitous in popular culture, yet they're also part of our faith. And uh, hopefully I gave everybody somewhat of a better Catholic understanding of angels. Um, and, and again, some of, some of what I mentioned tonight is the consensus of theologians or the opinion of saints. Um, we're, we're called to believe in angels no matter what because they are part of scripture. But um, some, of the, some of the finer points um, you can pray about and, and decide for yourself whether that's something you want to invest in. So, all right guys, thank you all very much. So, we got... John, I'll give you both. Thank you for coming to this, yeah. uh, this meeting.
and uh, we hope to have many more. This is the first one, and thanks for participating in the uh, experiment tonight. Good night. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I love the question. There are just so many questions. Oh, well, there always are. There's no, and, and there's always less answers than questions. You know.